You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, I am joined by Georgie Brown, the founder of Georgie and Me. Georgie, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you, Irene. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Um, typical fashion of the show, three segments. Listeners, regular listeners of the show will know that we spent the first couple of minutes getting to know you, and then we go into challenges, pivotal moments, getting your thoughts on some different topics. So you grew up in Dublin, if I'm correct. What was life like growing up in Dublin? Um, so actually, when I was quite young, we moved from Dublin to uh, Blessington. Both my parents are dubs, so it's always that confused kind of, who am I, where am I from, from, from straight away. Me too. If, if your parents are dubs, you know, you're supposed to be a dub. So um, I grew up in Blessington and um, it was, it was, I'd say, fairly normal until I was about 11 when my parents bought a pub um, and... Wow moved me in there um so a year later they bought a hotel and moved me in there so I was in Kildare from the time I was 11 um living in a kind of a business um slash home so interesting childhood didn't have like a kitchen or a sitting room like there was a lounge (laughs) with some people having pints and I'd be sitting at the bar doing my homework so um that's probably <laughs> been part of my development as a as a human, and um, probably a little bit of an unusual childhood. Wow, that's pretty interesting. So you're 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 somewhat forced to be an extrovert then, in a sense. Yeah, and I'm definitely an introvert, you know. And I do public speaking now and things like that, and people are like, "Oh, Georgie, you're so you're so outgoing." I'm like, honestly, I'm very happy by myself or by the sea yeah. in, in a really quiet environment. Um, but it, uh, yeah, a kind of an extroverted introvert, I think is the, the word. That's really cool. That's really cool. I am. Um, I went to secondary school. Uh, well, everyone does. But my first year in secondary school was on a race course, and I thought that was a cool story. The, our school wasn't built with Toad College, so they used various race courses as the school. So, like your English class was like a private private suite. Your French class was like the bar. P was running running a lap of the race course, which was 1.8 miles. And at 13 years old, I did not enjoy doing that. And I thought that was a cool story. But doing your homework at a bar and living in a hotel and restaurant, that's pretty, or a uh, pub, that's pretty cool, that is. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get much, uh, like, it, it was funny. I think um, I was telling somebody recently that I was put on PAYE when I was 12. So it's um, the youngest person I know that like was actually an employee when they were basically a child. When your family owned the business, it's it's legal to put you on the books. So um, well, like my weekends, I, I, I kind of became addicted to to working and earning money and and customer service um, mm. really early on. You know, it was like I think when I was I think it was about seven, um, my parents owned an Abercrombie franchise um, and that was their second business. So they were kind of new finding their feet in the, the entrepreneurial world. But I was learning like if I'm nice to those people, they'll give me a tip. And like yeah. I was a child. Um, so I learned that sure. at such a young age. I know you've talked about your parents and all the things they've owned. You just touched on a, a, a hotel, a, a pub, uh, an Abercrombie franchise. Um but people can usually point to a number of people that have had a positive impact on their early years um, that has helped them become or turn into the person they've become today. You know, they can point to uh, an acquaintance, a close friend, a family member, a relative, a teacher, um, any, anybody, and it could be more than one person spring to mind for you when I mention impact and influence. Yeah, I suppose just based on what I, I just said, I guess that the people that spring to mind would be my mum and dad. Like my dad worked in Premier Jet Dairies as a milkman. Um, um, my mum was doing the accounts. So they uh, they grew from very humble kind of beginnings um, mm. and by no means like hit the big time. But they, you know, they started off small with like a news agents, moved into a franchise, moved into a pub and, and sold each to move on quite slowly. So they, they probably be people to talk about scaling business. Um, so they were massive influence. And then they encouraged me not to start my own business. As soon as I was like 17, 18, I was like, OK, I'm going for this. And they were like, no, 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 go and get a job. Don't do what we did. Um, so it took me nearly 10 years, 15 years of working as a corporate employee before I actually went and, and did what I wanted to do. Um, so they were, they, they definitely influenced me in an unconscious way, so just by growing in that environment. But mm. in terms of advice, 
they were never the type to say follow your dream go go and do that it was like no 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 buy get a job buy a house settle them do all those things it was that advice um which in my early 30s I I had done all that and threw it all out the window so um I don't know <laughs> interesting well I do want to chat about some of your roles because it's clear to see that that their influence has paid off but before we get to that uh, I know you're doing a master's at the moment. It's your second one because you've got a, you've got another one in the bag from DIT in digital marketing and data analytics. What uh, had you choose that, or like was like yeah, what influenced you to decide to go on to complete that master's? I felt a little bit uh, like I didn't have enough skills or something. I was missing something, so I looked into it then. Um, and yeah, I decided what would stand to me as an entrepreneur if I if I actually do go and leave my job and become self-employed. And I thought the digital marketing would be a really nice add-on to sales um, as just to give a fuller mm. picture. So yeah, I had this other funny thing that I did when I was 29. I wrote a list of um, 30 things that I wanted to do before I was 30. Um, so I wouldn't advise anyone to do this. It was it, like, it was a really, really stupid idea. So I wrote the list and it had a whole range of things. And I was like, what would I like to achieve? Now being a woman hitting 30, no kids, not married, like, okay, so we put this kind of pressure on ourselves or maybe a human, not just a woman, you know, it's like, oh, this landmark is coming. What have I done? So I, I wrote a list and I, and I wrote down all the things I was afraid of. Um, so silly things like, going for dinner on my own, um, to becoming a yoga teacher, to running 10K, to having a master's. Um, and I got 29 of them done before I was 30. Um, wow. What was so, the one that you hadn't completed? I wanted to learn how to drive a motorbike and I still haven't done it, but I think I'm going to do it. Like, I, I think it'll be in 2021. So That's pretty yeah. badass. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad has a motorbike. And it's uh, it's always cool, but it's not as cool when you're sitting on the back compared to sitting on the front driving it. Yeah. Can you ride a motorbike? No, I cannot. I can just drive a car. Okay. Yeah. And I got a license when I was 18. So like I I went back and did the the, the test recently for the bike. Um, mm. And the guy said to me when I walked in, he was like, you're the first person that's ever had it that's come in to get the test again. And I was like, oh my gosh, is it on my license? I wasn't sure. And he was like, yeah, you, you did it when you were 18. I was like, okay. So this is something that I forget that I want to do um but it's still there so yeah I'm gonna go and would you like to learn yeah no definitely because he's looking at getting a new bike um and that's kind of we've been looking on online at different bikes and stuff and that's kind of turned me on to it um for sure for sure I just I I remember when whenever I was on the bike with him before I had two stories one was I was on the bike with him before and I always remember like you're like way more conscious of your surroundings when you're on the bike because people can just open their doors to get out of the car to get into the restaurant and they're not paying attention to bikes. It's like bikes are just like completely blind to some drivers compared to cars. Um, and I always get nervous when I, for the rider, when I see them drive up in, in between two cars on a lane to get to the red light because I'm like any one of these cars could just like try shift into the next lane and they're not paying attention to the bike. And then the other story I have was we were going down to visit my, my granny once my family are from Kilkenny and I was on the back of the bike with my dad and he had some cool helmets that like they have speakers in them so you can buy a Bluetooth hook to your phone. So I hadn't finished my leave. I'd finished my leave for two years prior. You can probably tell where this is going, but I uh, hit autoplay on my phone and the first couple of songs were fine, grand. And then about 10, 15 minutes into the journey, Leaving Cert Paper 2 came on and it talked me through the entire Leaving Cert Paper 2. So for an hour and a half driving into Kilkenny, all I was listening to was about Leaving Cert Paper 2 in English. Um, and I had completely Leaving Cert 2 years before. So when we got to Kilkenny, my dad was like, how was that? And I was like, shite, because all <laughs> I've learned about was Leaving Cert Paper 2, which I don't need to know anything about. Um, so yeah, no, but I definitely would at some point. You gave me so, an interesting thing there because I'm about 18 months away from turning 30. I haven't okay. had that idea for that list but that's a pretty cool idea so so let's rewind the clock to 2004 you were working as a business development manager smart telecom while there you won the top sales award in 2016 then you spent three years at merlin motor group where you sold 258 cars became the highest selling sales executive while there after that you spent almost five years down under in new zealand 
a variety of different sales roles before returning to Ireland and you spent a year as a national sales manager for Audi. So my question is, what did sales teach you about people and business? Any kind of lessons learned? Yeah, um, I think what sales taught me most, um, so so I have to credit this to, I, I did a business course. It was like a sales and sales management. When I finished school at nighttime, I was working during the day and I went to DBS. And our lecturer in sales said, um, if you want to get good at sales, go out and work as a door-to-door salesperson. So of course, I was highly ambitious at the time. I was like, I'm going to do that. So that's how I ended up in Smart Telecom. And what it taught me about people and business was really from the customer's perspective, because you don't get closer to somebody than knocking on their door unannounced and trying to sell them something. Um, And I think, as I mentioned, I'm a bit of an introvert so I was like comfort zone completely blown I'm knocking the, these people are having their dinner and I'm knocking on their door um and uh yeah I, I learned that that people are predominantly kind and nice and if you're nice to them they will be nice back um and I've heard some of your previous podcasts um about oh god Greg that was on who I've met through um the entrepreneurial circuit and um he said like just ask just ask because if you if you are a, a nice and a good and a kind person and you're not kind of taking the mick then people will generally respond well um mm. and I yeah I really learned that um yes there's people out there that won't be nice but there's probably something going on for them because I think people people want to help um and I learned how to ask questions. Um, so I learned, I guess, more about myself than, than others. To try to see people in their best light. I think it's the only way that we can get like through that. this life. Yeah, and the ability to ask the right questions at the right time, again, is incredibly important. You talk about Greg Fry, I think, you're referencing to. Yeah. He was yeah. kind enough to, to give me some of his time back in, back in the day. Um, but through this podcast, this is probably going to be episode like, 128 129 um of this year and 99 percent of the entrepreneurs ceos founders that i've got in touch with to talk to for 10 15 minutes they've all said yes i can only think of like one or two that have just says and it's like i'm, I'm busy ra- like ra- uh, raising investment or something it's not like no it's like no right now because my time is occupied so most of the time they're incredibly nice and friendly and are willing to give you their time yeah. So next part of the podcast is around networking because you said you're naturally a introvert, but you grew up in a pub and hotel and then you went into sales and knocked on people's doors and you've built yourself a nice network. You've you've mentioned a couple of guests on the podcast before we hit recording. Um, how important do you think networking is in your uh, journey as a business owner to continue to yeah, to continue to grow so you can tap in for referrals or introductions or just win clients. It's interesting that you say networking, Rain, because I actually had uh, did a little bit of networking as a business opportunity with with Facebook um, a couple mm. of years back, and I hosted their networking sessions for Platform F, um, which was an entrepreneurial startup kind of vibe where I helped people to talk to each other um, and to network, I suppose, effectively. Um, so yeah, I do I do think it's extremely important, but I absolutely hate networking events um, because I'm a bit shy. You know, you're standing there, you've got your cup of tea and you're like, is somebody going to come over? What am I going to say? And what's the purpose? So I hate wasting time, but I love I love learning. And so that's why I hosted those sessions. and, and, And it was, I suppose, the secret sauce with that was everyone had one question to ask the person that they met and I divided people up into different different groups and got them to ask a stranger to solve their biggest business problem um the stranger had a minute to learn about the business um and three minutes to respond and people came to me afterwards and they had such good experiences that some of their you know they maybe got their hands on a developer that they really needed or you know something that they didn't expect to get from a stranger (laughs) and it was Mm. like mind blowing for people. So yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, on my own kind of terms, I don't like being put into a room and being, you know, just, just 
go flee talk to strangers um if there's a purpose if I can find a purpose without coming across really cheesy and asking people strategic questions so um yeah I think it's important to get to know people um to keep those people close especially in this crazy online world that we're living in um if we can maintain our network it's it's vital I absolutely agreed. Um, the, I don't think the podcast has aired yet, but it's with Alan Coleman from Sweeper, so it will be aired by the time this is out. Um, he sold his first business for $65 million, if I'm not mistaken, and I spoke to him about networking as well. And one of the things he said was, like, he has a, a dis, not a dislike for it, but he doesn't enjoy it as well because you're going into a room and everyone can play at the scenario, but what he thinks is a potential opportunity for someone to like be able to match people up to chat for those three or four minutes to kind of discover something about a stranger and see if it's worth continuing the conversation. But maybe even he thinks taking it a step further and like the host has a look at who's coming and goes, you know, this person should be talking to this person, this person should be talking to this person. And then doing these kind of like talk for five minutes and move, talk for five minutes and move. So you're matched up with someone who the host thinks you'll get get value from. But that was exactly what I did over in London. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was through an app and we got people's backgrounds and it was all facilitated in that way. Um, so it's amazing. I love hearing about people that have had the same ideas. I used to hmm. wonder, like, how did, did somebody steal my idea? And it's like so many people get these great ideas because it's, if, if he's a similar kind of person and he's a bit introverted and he doesn't like wasting time, I guess maybe everybody doesn't like wasting time. And um, so probably tons of people have had that very idea. Um, you executed it, on it, though. He just mentioned it as, a, as an idea. You actually did it. I did. I did. I didn't build the app. I got the plans. I went through it. 90% of the process and that's a problem I need to look at myself um but I never launched it um but I did I did build it and I did test it yeah so you're doing another masters at the moment while having your own business Georgie and me so can you take 30 seconds to kind of tell it tell us about your business and, and, and what it is for those who are not familiar with it yeah yeah sure so um it's about behavior change. I work with companies um, or more so the executives within companies um, or entrepreneurs and executives in their own right. Um, and I offer coaching on a one-to-one -one basis and training on a group basis. Um, so it will be about mindfulness-based techniques. Um, it could be finding people's strengths and helping them to flourish on the basis of what they're good at, um, taking a positive action. Um, forward and kind of positive psychology interventions to help us create behavior change and um, so during my master's I worked a lot on a one-to-one -one basis with people I didn't do as many events um, probably because things went online and I wasn't ready for that with the big groups I've just started in the last few weeks doing some more corporate work online um, so that's yeah that's the, the basis of what I do probably not a great USP but <laughs> that's it you you should try and connect with Lorna Lawless. She uh, she's been on the podcast oh probably three months ago, but she's part of the Wimp to Warrior program for like John Kavanagh. Um, but she's the psychologist on that team, and and she's got a great mind as well. I'm more than happy to give you an introduction. I've chatted to her a couple of times on on the podcast and uh, via email as well. Um, I'll leave links to your site and your LinkedIn below. I know your site has a blog as well that I read a number of the blogs on. So those, whether you're watching or listening to this, will be in the description field below. A couple more questions. Your favorite part of being your own boss? Have you got one? Um, you know, I've, I've struggled during the, the lockdown, I think, with the, the isolation side of things or the virtual world. Um, so... I would have said prior to the pandemic that it was about the freedom, um, being able to, you know, have my morning routine and have my evening routine and, and be quite flexible. Um, and I was working with a lot of consultants and different people back then, but my favorite part of being my own boss at the moment, I, it, it, I'm not quite sure. I'm not going to the answer to that question, Irene. To be honest with you, it's something that I've, I've been struggling with and I'm really looking forward to getting in, back into in-person meetings and in-person training, as I'm sure a lot of people are. Um, Me too. So, yeah. Um, 
my favorite part was the connection that I felt with people and doing the work. Um, it's it's wonderful and great that we can connect online. Zoom is a great tool. It doesn't replace human connection. Um, and if I <laughs> positive psychology is giving you the negative, um, so if I flip it that way, it's it's that's what I miss the most, and I'm looking forward to getting back into human connection. I was thinking of this the other day. There's a there's a conference that I attend three times a year. Um, and it's over in the States and they did it virtual for the last probably 18 months. Um, and it was never the same after I, after the two days I logged off and I was sitting in this room and I was like, well, that's the end. That's mad. This, there's some feeling about it that I don't get the same feeling as the in-person conversations or in-person conferences. And I was trying to think like, what is it that's missing? And then I was like, it's, it's the hallway conversations. It's the, it's the after conference conversations. It's like, the part that I enjoy most is like you get a 15 minute break from one talk and you go out and you're getting a coffee, but you're chatting to someone for 15 minutes about a problem or an issue or like how they are and different things. And then after the conference, you're going for drinks and dinner and chatting through more problems and issues. And what was your thought of that? What did you think of this? Did you like when he said this or she said that? So you missed all of that. And some people try to do it with like zoom breaker rooms during the 15 minutes, but a lot of people were like, go and take care of their kid when they've got that 15 minutes or like go and make a coffee themselves and they got that 15 minutes and you're never really getting that side like hallway conversation because you can't force a hallway conversation it just happens yeah. so i'm definitely looking forward to getting back into in person as well um a couple more questions actually two more one is if i gave you the uh, decision making power to add one mandatory subject to the secondary school curriculum uh what would it be and why um, it's probably this is <laughs> going to be a typical answer from a kind of a, a mindset mindfulness teacher. Um, yeah, so so I'd say meditation. Um, and as I say that, there's something else that's coming to mind. I know some of the Steiner schools, um, they have a module called clowning, um, where mm. where kids are taught in primary school how to get up and, and go on stage and be a clown. And they laugh at themselves. Um, and do you know, I might add that actually. I, I mean, I'd like everyone to learn meditation, but I think there's a lot of people like saying that out, out loud. And I'm gonna Google that, that's pretty interesting. Come. But if we could add clowning in, because I think we take ourselves way too seriously, do you know, doing lives and things like that. Even me, myself, I don't put myself out there enough because you know, I'm you still worried about what people might think. Um, and I think if we could instill that into kids, that it doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks. You just have to learn to like yourself. Um, and mm. the rest, the rest is easy. So clowning. I like that answer. That's a different answer than usual. Usually it's like something to do with finance or <laughs> business. I think Alan Coleman again gave a similar answer. He didn't say clowning, but he was like around um oh, I can't think of the right word, but yeah, it, 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 it was in line in, in line with what you're saying. So the final question I have for you is around your travels. I know you spent some time down in New Zealand. Um, you also had the pleasure to travel to India, study Bo Buddhism, uh, and trained under the Dalai Lama. Uh, you went to a Plum Village Zen monastery. Sorry for the listeners, I read that out loud in <laughs> France. Um, what were those experiences like? Um, again, a little bit like meditation, something that one needs to experience maybe like the hallway chats at the conference you can't really quantify it you can't put it into words it's like an experience um but to try to put it into words for people um and I'm sure a lot of people have gone to India it's an, it's an amazing place and Plum Village Monastery over in France is 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 a wonderful wonderful place um I think they've taught me how much I still have to learn. Um, I'd never call myself an expert in anything, even though I've, I've meditated for more than 20 years. I still don't think I'm any good at it. Um, it's it's not about becoming good at those skills or good at spirituality. Mm -hmm. It's more about becoming a better person than you were yesterday. And, and you know, getting up and seeing each new day is an opportunity. And that is something that you, you know, you can't kind of read in a book, you have to do the work on it. Um, so yeah, that's, the, the, I think that the, I had like a, a little story, I guess, from the India trip, um, which really impacted me. I was at the time working for Audi um, and I was 
national sales manager so I was you know driving a really nice company car um good salary <laughs> good job like it was probably a dream job and someone popped in on LinkedIn and asked me would I go for it and I was like I was busy trying to like build my little business here but okay dream job came along I'll go and do it when I was in India um there was a conference where um or a talk I suppose Dalai Lama was talking and they hand out bread rolls fresh bread rolls like thousands of them and cups of tea to everybody and um there was a man in front of me and he had uh, he had his role in and he seen me like and I was a kind of a, a youngish I probably look younger than I am but he's seen this young woman and he wanted to give me his food um and I said no I you know I'm okay I I, I have one I'm okay and like this man had had no shoes couldn't speak any English but they they weren't needy or looking like these people weren't begging he wasn't looking for money but when he smiled at me he he smiled and he had no no teeth and but I, like I couldn't but like I tried to hold back the tears but the overwhelming sense of love that came from him was something I've never felt and it that moved me to say okay if I can teach even one person how to love themselves how to be a bit kinder um and that's why I went home and I was like okay there's my notice I'm out here I'm gonna do this <laughs> very cool very cool Georgie it's, it's been a pleasure spending the, the the morning chatting to you um I hope our listeners get value from this and look you can you can connect with Georgie on social link all her links will be below and link to the blog and uh to to to, to learn more uh but for today thanks for being my guest Thank you, Irene. It was lovely to see you again. Hopefully we'll be out on the bike someday.